Okay, well. Um, so welcome, yes, let me introduce you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to Dr. Lisa Markant uh, from the Stony Brook University. And uh, she's going to talk about uh, evolutions of a cubic fourfold. Yes, uh, thank you very much. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers for organizing a really good conference so far. I'm looking forward to the rest of the week. And again, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak today. So yes, yeah, so I want to talk today about um, cubic fourfolds with uh, what's called an anti-symplectic involution. Um, so before we dive straight in, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about why I'm talking about cubic fourfolds in a conference about hypercalar manifolds. Um, okay, so a cubic fourfold is a Fano fourfold. And if we look at the Hodge decomposition of the middle cohomology, we see that it has Hodge numbers 0, 1, 21, 1, 0. And um, to anybody who's familiar with K3 surfaces, this would look very, very uh, familiar. It was uh, very similar to K3 surfaces. So in fact, there is a very close relation to K3 surfaces. Um, uh, and they, uh, Beauville and Donaghi proved that if you take a smooth cubic fourfold and look at the Fano variety of lines, then this is in fact um, a hypercalar manifold and it's deformation equivalent to one of K32 types, so the Hilbert scheme of two points on a K3 surface. Uh, there are other various constructions that one can do from starting from a cubic fourfold. Um, uh, and to get a hypercalar, but I don't really want to talk about them today. Um, so why is this, this relation to K3 surfaces kind of interesting? Well, if we start with our, cu our cubic fourfold and we vary it, well, cubic fourfolds have a moduli space, a 20-dimensional moduli space, whereas the moduli space for K3 surfaces, uh, projective K3 surfaces, is a 19-dimensional. Um, so we seem to get more examples by looking at the Fano variety of the lines on the cubic fourfold. So more examples of this K32 type hypercalar manifold. Uh, so I'm interested in orthomorphisms, uh, more particularly involution. So why is this kind of interesting? Well, there's from the point of view of studying automorphism, this leads to what's called exotic automorphism. So we might be able to find orthomorphisms of hypercalar manifolds that are not induced from a K3 surface. Um, exactly. And if we're looking at, uh, at automorphisms, uh, we say that an automorphism is symplectic if it induces a symplectic automorphism on the variety of lines, so on, the, uh, on that associated hypercalar. And so indeed, like following this kind of idea, um, in 2019, Lazar and Zeng classified all possible groups of symplectic automorphisms for cubic fourfolds by using the period map and um, some lattice theoretic methods. <clears throat> okay. Um, and so, of course, by studying these, autom these symplectic automorphisms, this gives us information about the symplectic automorphisms on the Fano variety. Okay, so now I'm not really going to say anything about hypercalar manifolds, and I'm just going to focus on uh, cubic fourfolds. Um, and in order to study um, automorphisms, we're going to need some uh, lattice theoretic methods. So I just wanted to uh, do a kind of brief reminder of some of the lattice theory that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so. And what is, a, what is a lattice? So an even lattice is a free finitely generated Z module equipped with a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form. So we say the lattice is even if the self-intersection of any element of the lattice is even and is odd otherwise. Um, so what's going to be important is the, this discriminant group uh, of a lattice. So you take the dual lattice and you um, mod up the lattice. And this is going to be a finite abelian group. Uh, and throughout, I'm probably going to mention these ADE lattices. So in this talk today, uh, these ADE lattices denote the standard positive definite root lattices. And new here is the, is the hyperbolic line, or the hyperbolic lattice. 
Uh, we say that a, a lattice is unimodular if this discriminant group I, I just defined is a, is a trivial group. And we say that it's uh, two elementary if this is a uh, two elementary abelian group. So Z mod 2Z to some power. Okay, so how can I use lattice theory to study, uh, to study automorphisms of a cubic four fold? Okay, so let's uh, take notation. So this X throughout is going to be a smooth cubic fourfold, so in P5. And we're going to focus our attention on the middle cohomology, so H4. And so if we consider this with the natural intersection pairing, uh, we see that this is actually an odd unimodular lattice of signature 21, 2. Uh, so from a point of view of, of lattice theory, odd lattices are not so nice to work with. So we prefer to work with even. Uh, so, if I denote by h squared the square of the hyperplane class of x, so x always comes with the, the hyperplane class because we're inside of P5, so we have a natural polarization, and we just take the square, this will live in h4, and so we can consider um, everything that is orthogonal with respect to the inter natural intersection pairing on x uh, to the square of the hyperplane class, and so this is called the, the primitive class. This is an even lattice. It's no longer unimodular, but it's still even uh, of signature 22. Uh, and it carries a polarized Hodge structure uh, of K3 type. So we have um, uh, we have Hodge number 0, 1, 20, 1, 0. <clears throat> Okay, so in fact, as a lattice, uh, we can say a bit more. We know exactly what this is, uh, this is isomorphic to. So it's isomorphic to two copies of E8, uh, plus two copies of the hyperbolic plane, uh, plus a copy of A2. So uh, this, this A2 here um, uh, has discriminant group Z mod 3Z. So this whole lattice has discriminant group Z mod 3Z now, rather than being unimodular. Okay, so once we have this lattice, we're gonna follow kind of the ideas um, the behind the period map of uh, K3 sub. That's kind of what's motivating this discussion. And so uh, following kind of this story, we can define uh, the period domain. So we take the complexified lattice and we projectivize it. And we just look at this set here. So this is the, the period domain for cubic fourfold. And if we take uh, the global monodromy group, uh, so this is a subgroup of asymmetries of the lattice that preserves this domain and also acts trivially on this uh, group, this on this discriminant group. So this group acts properly discontinuously on this domain. And so we can take uh, the quotient and uh, this is actually a quasi-projective variety, also called the, the global domain, period, the global period domain for cubic four. Uh, okay. On the other hand, we have uh, the, Moduli space, the classical moduli space is smooth cubic fourfold. So we can construct this using uh, using GIT. And this is a uh, so we're just taking the smooth cubic fourfold here, and this is a quasi-projective twenty-dimensional variety. So uh, this is also twenty-dimensional. Um, and how are they related? So um, Boisson show uh, Boisson first showed that the um, to global Torelli theorem is true for cubic fourfold. So the period map that takes it takes a cubic fourfold and associates to it its Hodge structure. Um, and uh, work of Hassett, Lazar, and Ojenga uh, worked on showing what the image was of this period map. So this period map for cubic fourfold is an isomorphism from the moduli space of smooth cubic fourfold onto its image inside of this, uh, this period domain. And what's its image? Well, it, it's everything apart from this union of two irreducible divisors. So I don't really want to talk about these divisors too much, but this uh, one can think of this C2 as parameterizing singular cubic fourfolds, and this C6 is the generation of cubic fourfolds. Uh, so what does this give us? Gives us this gives us a way um, from a, uh, this gives us a way to associate to a smooth cubic fourfold its Hodge structure. Okay, so in fact, uh, slightly stronger is true. So um, I think this is more recently, maybe 
2019, uh, Zheng, this is due to Zheng, um, he proved the following strong global Torelli theorem. So we have, if we let x1 and x2 be two smooth cubic four folds, and we assume that we have an isomorphism of polarized Hodge structures between um, that middle cohomology, uh, then we can say that this is actually induced by an isomorphism of the cubic four folds themselves. So in particular, we have this isomorphism of groups. So on the left-hand side, we have the automorphism group of a smooth cubic fourfold. And on the right-hand side, we have um, Hodge structure isomorphisms on H4 that fix the polarization. And so this is exactly going to give me an automorphism of my uh, primitive cohomology. And so what we can do if we want to study automorphisms of X, we can just study instead automorphisms of the primitive lattice, uh, which is essentially a lattice theoretic question. Uh, okay, so that's what we're going to do today. So instead of studying automorphisms on X, we're going to study the automorphisms on the primitive cohomology. Okay, so L here throughout is going to denote um, the primitive cohomology. So this was an even lattice. So whenever I'm going to focus a little bit more on involutions now, rather than automorphisms, we're going to zoom in on onto uh, onto involutions. So if we have an involution of a lattice, then we can take uh, it determines two eigenspaces. So this L plus here is what's called the invariant sublattice. So this is all the classes in the primitive cohomology that are fixed by my involution. And this L negative is the co-invariant lattice. Uh, you just take the orthogonal uh, to L plus with respect to the intersection pairing. Um, yeah, okay, so if we take the, uh, the direct sum, this is a sub lattice of the primitive cohomology. And if we take this kind of quotient, we see that we actually get a two elementary group. So this is kind of a bit technical, but this is what's gonna allow us to, um, to study these uh, the automorphism a bit um, lattice theoretically. <clears throat> okay, so here I want to be a bit more precise. So if we look at our middle cohomology and we, with the Z coefficients, and we intersect uh, with the H22, this is what's called the algebraic uh, sublattice of X. So classes inside of here are going to be uh, classes of the uh, uh, Hodge classes, and so they're going to be surfaces that are contained in my cubic four hole. Uh, on the other hand, I can take the orthogonal, uh, the orthogonal lattice to this inside of inside of the the full cohomology, and this is going to be the transcendental lattice of my cubic four hole. And so I say that an involution of my cubic four hole is symplectic if it acts trivially on H three one. So in other words, this is equivalent to saying that this transcendental lattice, the perpendicular of all the algebraic classes, is contained in my invariant lattice. On the other hand, I'm interested in anti-symplectic uh, involution. So an anti-symplectic, the transcendental lattice will be contained in the um, co-invariant sub-lattice L negative. And so this just allows us uh, this, along with this technical uh, kind of bit about um, this embedding group, this just gives us a way to compute the, the rank and the signature of these lattices. Um, so if we have an anti-symplectic involution, so here the transcendental lattice will be contained in the, in the co-invariant lattice, so L negative, uh, then we can show that L negative is actually a two elementary uh, lattice uh, and it's indefinite, so signature R minus two, two. Whereas L, posit L positive, L plus, the invariant lattice is a positive definite rank two, um, uh, rank, uh, sorry, whatever the rank is, and this is a discriminant group. But the more important part is it's a positive definite. Okay, so when I say I want to study an involution uh, on the lattice, what am I really saying? I really want to identify these two lattices. I want to identify the invariant of the lattice. And so if I have an anti-symplectic involution, this L plus is gonna be contained inside 
uh, the primitive algebraic classes. So if we take this lattice I defined here, the algebraic lattice, and intersects with the primitive homology, um, L plus is going to be contained inside of that. And so for a general cubic uh, full fold with, uh, this, uh, with an evolution, this L plus is going to be equal to um, the primitive algebraic homology. Okay, so now let's talk about some geometry. Okay, so let's blast this. So let's talk about the geometry of what's going on. So if I have a cubic full fold, um, this is just defined by a cubic equation in five variables. And in fact, if I have an automorphism of uh, such an X, I can actually lift it to an automorphism of the ambient piece phi. And so once we lift to a, an automorphism of P5, we can apply linear changes of coordinates and we can diagonalize our involution. So it becomes very easy to write down what the possible involutions of a cubic fourfold are. And so this was done uh, in 2011 um, by Gonzalez, Aguilera, and Leander. I think they also did it for cubic threefolds and not just the involution. Um, so what can we say? So if we take uh, an involution phi of my cubic fourfold, after a linear coordinate change, we have one of the following possibilities. So this notation here is just the diagonal matrix. So you have a bunch of ones and then a bunch of minus ones, and this is acting on the coordinates x0 through to x5. And so um, from this kind of description, we see that we have two possible anti-symplectic involutions and one symplectic involution. Um, so I'm mostly going to be focusing on this, this third uh, anti-symplectic involution today, um, but I'll mention this one too. Okay. I'm not sure how much time I had left. I'm not sure when I started, but uh, I think we had around at least 10 minutes, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Excellent. Um, okay, so if we want to try and identify um, some invariant uh, primitive classes, I should start by looking for some invariant surface classes that are contained in X. So the kind of the goal is to try and find some invariant surfaces that are contained in my cubic four board. And actually, this uh, description of the involutions this enables us to write down um, more precisely uh, this equa an equation of x with these involutions. And it becomes very obvious um, that this x contains a lot of uh, invariant planes. Um, Ah, I don't know. Sorry. I don't know what happened to that. I don't know why it's not letting you change slides. Okay. Okay, so what can we say? So if we let X be a, a cubic four fold with an anti symplectic involution, but I'm going to focus on C3, but the same method works for the other anti symplectic involution. Then we can immediately show that X contains at least 19 invariant distinct planes. It contains a lot of planes. Uh, so firstly, this P3, uh, how is this acting? So it fixes the first coordinate, so X0 up to X3, and then just acts by minus one on the last three coordinates. And so if we write down the equation of X, we see that the X3, the X4, and the X5, they can only appear um, with, we don't have any like cubes and we can't have them appearing by themselves in order for the equation of X to be invariant. Uh, and so these, these, these LIs and this, uh, this G, these are all uh, equations in just the first variable. So X0, X1, and X2. And so immediately we'll see that uh, such a cubic is gonna contain uh, this, this plane. So in fact, this plane is fixed by the involution. And so once we get a single plane, we can consider linear projection from uh, that plane. Um, right, and so what does that give us? So if we blow up the plane, um, this gives us a quadric vibration over P2. So how should we think of this, uh, this projection? Well, this 
Phase P2 is parameterizing P3 slices of X that contains this plane P. And so um, if I'm intersecting X with a P3, I should get something of degree three. And so the fiber here is gonna be the residual quadric that you get um, when you intersect. And the singular fibers are gonna be parameterized by a plane sector curve in P2. And now what's good uh, about this, uh, the involution is that from this, uh, this, this equation of X, um, you can immediately write down the equation for C. And in this case, it splits as the union of two irreducible cubic curves instead of a, uh, an irreducible sector. And so if you look at a, a uh, smooth point on this plane sextic, well, the fiber is just going to be a quadric cone. Whereas if we take one of the intersection points of the smooth of the cubic, um, this is going to have worse singularities. And because X is a smooth cubic, you can actually show that the fiber has to be a union of two planes. So we have nine intersection points, so we have nine pairs of planes, plus the one we projected from. Um, okay. And so these, uh, these planes are what's going to enable us to uh, identify our um, invariant sublattice. Okay, so great. So just to, to quickly mention this uh, C1, um, this is the other anti symplectic involution. So this was already studied um, by Laza, Parstone, and Zhang. They use a slightly different method um, to my method. Um, but what did they show? So here they classify the invariant sublattice of the uh, primitive cohomology. And in fact, they, they say a little bit more. So they say a cubic fourfold with uh, this involution, this is equivalent to having what's called an Eckhart point. Um, and so you, they can show that this X contains um, a cone over a cubic surface. And uh, if you take the lines on the cubic surface and take the cone over them, uh, you get a, a lot of, by 27 planes. So what did they show? So uh, first of all, they contain these 27 planes, and then they, they, they show that this uh, invariant sublattice, so the algebraic uh, primitive classes, is isomorphic to an E62 and is spanned by exactly the differences of these planes. Um, and they also have a nice description of the transcendental uh, cohomology of X. So this will be uh, the co-invariant lattice, so the classes which aren't invariant. And this is isomorphic to three copies of D4 um, plus two copies of, of U. Um, yeah, so what did, what did I show? So uh, uh, we did the same, a similar thing for, for P3. So first of all, we have a similar statement. We contain at least 18 invariant planes and they all intersect the, uh, the fixed plane. And again, if we look at the differences uh, between the planes, uh, they generate the primitive cohomology along with an extra class, which isn't immediately obvious. And so we don't have quite a nice description, but we have that this lattice is isomorphic to the unique uh, positive definite lattice of rank 10, which is obtained as a index two over lattice of, of this lattice here. Uh, and we also um, uh, can describe the transcendental cohomology of X here. Um, okay. So uh, I don't really want to talk about the method uh, involved this. I, I want to kind of focus on consequences. So whenever we have a family of cubic fourfolds, um, kind of the next question is to ask is about whether this cubic fourfold could potentially be rational. And um, uh, one conjecture is that if the transcendental cohomology um, can be embedded into the K3 lattice or can be realized as the transcendental lattice of a K3 surface, then uh, your cubic fourfold is potentially rational. So I think the conjecture is that it, it would be rational. And indeed, you can see that this transcendental lattice this can be um, this can be embedded into the K3 lattice. So there is, does exist a K3 surface with this transcendental lattice. Um, so, uh, so what can we what can we say in terms of rationality? Um, uh, maybe I won't say this. 
Um, so, okay, so this is a bullet point I wanted to say. So, first of all, um, we know that a cubic fourfold is going to be rational if it contains two distinct planes. Um, we can use these uh, two distinct planes which do not intersect. Um, we can use these planes to construct a um, construct the map. Um, in our case, this, these uh, cubic fourfolds with uh, with this intersection, they do contain lots of planes, but unfortunately, they all intersect. And one way to see this is if we look at this uh, vibration, and if we had a distinct plane, this would give us a rational section of this vibration, which would mean it would have to intersect the fiber um, oddly. And our description of the um, of our lattices enables us to show that this just can't be the case. So we just cannot uh, contain two uh, non-intersecting planes. So all our planes intersect. Uh, however, it is uh, it is uh, actually rational. So um, it's kind of proven in a little bit of a roundabout way. So um, what do I want to say? So if we look at these, uh, so whenever we have a, a surface class inside of um, my cubic fourfold X, which isn't homologous to a complete intersection, we can take this sub lattice, um, which is just the intersection, which is just generated by the square of the hyperplane section and that surface. And this will have some determinant um, D. And so if we let CD denote the cubic fourfold uh, with such a sub lattice inside of the, the, algebraic, uh, the algebraic lattice, um, then this is gonna denote uh, this is going to define a uh, irreducible divisor in the moduli space of uh, cubic fourfolds. This is due to half it, uh, if and only if these conditions on this just determinant. And so uh, this description of the algebraic lattice enables me to identify which divisors, uh, which half the divisors that this uh, family of cubic fourfolds are contained in. And in fact, they're actually contained in every single possible non empty uh, divisor. And in particular, uh, this implies that they're rational. So lots of these divisors, uh, for example, uh, C14 is the closure of the tracking cubic uh, locus. And it's uh, known that every element inside of this uh, divisor is rational. So uh, we kind of get the rationality kind of for free. Um, so it's interesting to notice that I think it's been shown that the intersection of all of these half divisors is at least 13 dimensional. And so uh, if you remember these X's with this uh, involution C3, there was a 10 dimensional family. So if you did a 10 dimensional um, uh, sub, sub family, I guess. And uh, previously, I think it was known that uh, the intersection contained uh, only the Fermat cubic. Um, which is in, which indeed has one of these involutions. Um, so I think I'm probably out of time. So I guess I will stop. So uh, thank you very much. Is there any questions? Thank you, Lisa, for the talk. Is there any question? Uh, maybe I have one question. Yes. Sure. What about the the map giving the the rationality in uh, in that case? I mean, is the one yeah, that yeah. gives the unirrationality or uh, the, is another one? Um, so that's a good question. So, um, so uh, uh, because X is contained in the, uh, the C14 locus and it does not contain two distinct planes, uh, one can show that it actually contains a... Um, uh, a cortex scroll, a rational normal uh, cortex scroll. And I think uh, this is enough to give the, the, the map on rationality. I think it's, uh, it's then going to be birational to the like symmetric product of this uh, surface. But um, I haven't, uh, it's hard to see it uh, geometrically from, from the equations and stuff. I, I would like to try and find this, this surface um, inside of X more explicitly, but I uh, um, haven't been able to as of yet. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions?
But is, sorry, Lisa. So you, at a certain point, you said that this discriminant locus of the quadric uh, bound mm -hmm. is uh, the union of uh, two uh, cubic curves, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. the, over the singular points of the discriminant locus, there are a um, couple of planes. Mm -hmm. But is this for every? This no. So this is point? special. So. Ah, okay. The five. In in gen yeah. In general, when you have when you do projection from a plane, um, this sextic uh, curve here will be uh, like an irreducible sextic curve if your x is general. But the fact that it has this involution and it has um, forces this sextic to to split into this these irreducible. So I I think um, I think this curve this curve is. Uh, always smooth if there doesn't exist a plane that intersects the plane that you're projecting from. Yeah. Oh, I see. But is it possible yeah. to realize all these uh, cubic fourfolds as, as uh, uh, quadric bundles over P2 or not? Um, no, I think, uh, no. So this is, uh, in general, uh, like a, a, a general edge okay. won't contain a plane, yeah. Yes. You need you need to contain the plane. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Are there any uh, other questions? Okay. Uh, yes, I have a question. Okay. Great. Uh, uh, yes, please. Who is talking? Ah, oh, sorry. Oh, I I thought that will, I wouldn't. Uh, so do we know the fixed locus of the, this involution? Do we know anything about the fixed locus? Yes, yeah, so the fixed locus is going to be this plane um, peak uh, that I have here. And then it's also going to be a, a cubic curve. So, uh, and the curve is going to be given by uh, this equation G. So this, this bit G here is this is a degree three polynomial in X zero, X one and X two. And so uh, if you take the plane x, x3 equals x4, x, x5 all equals to zero uh, and intersect with this cubic, you'll just get this, this curve and that's also fixed. Yeah. But, but that's, the, that's the fixed look. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, other questions? Okay, if not, thank you, Lisa, again, for the beautiful Great. talk. Thank and you. Now, yes, we will have a break until 11, uh, uh, 20.